Welcome uh, to this uh, presentation. Um, it's a great delight to welcome uh, back to MIT uh, Dr. Mustafa Tarab. Uh, Dr. Tarab, uh, as I hope you all know, uh, has his PhD from MIT in civil and environmental engineering. Uh, he received his PhD in 1990. And uh, he serves as the CEO and chairman of OCP in Morocco. Uh, OCP is the world's largest exporter of um, uh, uh, phosphate rock and, uh, 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 let me get this right, phosphoric acid, uh, and also one of the world's largest uh, producers of fertilizer. Uh, Dr. Tarab began his career in 1983 as an analyst at Bechtel. He received, uh, after he received his PhD from MIT, he served as a professor at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute before he was called back to Morocco, where he served as an advisor in Morocco's uh, royal cabinet. In 1992, Dr. Tarab uh, 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 took that position, and then in 1998, he was appointed director general of the Moroccan National Telecommunications Regulatory Agency and went on in 2002 to serve the World Bank as the lead regulatory specialist in the Global Information and Communications Department. In 2006, he was appointed the uh, general director for OCP, and then in 2008 um, uh, was uh, uh, appointed the CEO and chairman. Uh, during this time since 2008, uh, Dr. Tarab's leadership has produced a great deal of growth and expansion of um, OCP's activities and responsibilities, um, and also its footprint with respect to leadership in environment and sustainability. Dr. Tarab has also been an active member of the MIT community. Uh, he's been working with uh, MIT, MIT Sloan faculty, on these issues of environment and sustainability and others. Um, we're proud to engage with uh, OCP on an important executive education program uh, that is uh, developing um, OCP's own um, employees. And uh, Dr. Tarab uh, was willing recently to come back to MIT Sloan um, in a back to the classroom session with our own MIT alumni. Dr. Tarab's commitment to education is also reflected um, in his designation by King Mohammed VI uh, to a leadership role in developing a new university for Morocco. Please welcome back to MIT, Dr. Tarab. Let's see if I'm going to get the same response. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> Dean Schmidtlein, thank you very much for this kind of introduction, and it's uh, great to, to be back here. Uh, I don't recall taking any class in this uh, amphitheater, but it's, uh, it's very good to be here. What I, I thought about what would be most useful to talk, to tell you about what we lived in terms of transforming this company, and I decided to do it very inductively, uh, in, you know, time-wise, how did we actually uh, stumbled across the things uh, we did, the, uh, uh, you know, uh, because uh, what I didn't want to come across is that the transformation of this size is, follows a strategizing exercise, that you, a deterministic path, that you, you know exactly where you are, where you want to go, and that you just pick the right tools to do that, uh, and you're determined to implement these tools. That's not at least what we went through. I have a few colleagues here that lived some of this with me, it is much more chaotic, but uh, on the other hand, you have to have the capacity to reflect almost permanently on what you're doing. So you have to have a strategy. It just shouldn't be deterministic. It should allow for chaos and uncertainty. So the best way to convey this is just to go through actually how we lived this experience. Uh, I'm going to try to I have to say this because otherwise you, not, you won't understand what I'm saying in terms of the complexities of the business. Our, our value chain is, it looks like this. We start with phosphate rock, which is a mining activity. Some of it is sold on the international market. 
The rest is transformed in-house in, in uh, industrial, chemical industrial complexes to produce the phosphoric acid, uh, which is a mid product that itself has a market, uh, but some of it is also kept in-house to produce the finished product, which is the fertilizer. Uh, that's our value chain. We have industrial and mining assets in Morocco, but elsewhere we have also uh, fertilizer companies in India uh, and in Europe, but it's basically mines that are linked to fertilizer plants that are better positioned on the ocean close to the, to the ports to export either the mining or the, the fertilizer. We have joint ventures internationally with many of our clients and partners. In fact, this is our footprint from a commercial perspective. Uh, but also from an industrial perspective, as I told you, we have a plant here in, uh, in India, in Orissa, and plants uh, in Europe, but also in Georgia uh, and in France. But we have a fairly diversified commercial foot footprint. We sell phosphate rock as well as fertilizers in 60 countries in all the five continents. When, when we when I started looking at this business in 2006, you know, I initially hired consultants to do an independent business review, tell me a bit what the sector looked like. I realized that we had a significant market share in the early parts of the value chain, 40% of export seaborne market share in both rock and phosphoric acid, but only 11% in the finished products. Well, the first problem with that is that growth was only happening here, consumption growth. Demand was actually declining in the first part uh, of the value chain. So, for, so that was the first issue. We were very strong in a, in a business that was declining. Uh, second thing we looked at are what are the prices, evolution of prices through time, going back to the 70s. This is in real, in, I'm sorry, in nominal prices. You, know, you could be surprised. I don't know any uh, commodity that has remained flat over 30 years in nominal dollars. In real dollars, obviously, this has gone down. And that has led to a company, when I got there in 2006, that was making losses from year to year. Obviously, the costs in, 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 <laughs> in real uh, terms go up, in uh, nominal terms go up. Uh, and had a negative equity in its balance sheet. So actually, we couldn't be a corporation legally. You need to have positive equity. But our balance sheet had negative equity of $1.5 billion. So this was the situation, uh, declining, uh, you know, strong in something that didn't have much of a future, and with uh, financial and, uh, uh, and, and health problems, so to speak. Well, then we looked at what kind of business are we in, really. You know, uh, what is this used for? So a quick lesson on phosphate and fertilizer. Fertilizers are made of three nutrients, uh, nitrogen, phosphate, and potash. They're not substitutable for one and the other. If you, you, cannot, if you run out of phosphate, you cannot uh, substitute with potash. And then we looked at the demand. Well, look at just this. This is the amount of arable land available per capita to us. Uh, and the bad news is in less than 40 years, we will have half the arable land per capita to live with. Not difficult to realize that the only way out is to increase the productivity per hectare of the land. And that can be, there are several ways to view this. This is just looking at grain production. Basically, uh, the only way to increase productivity of a fixed amount of land is to increase the use of technology, but also fertilizer. So the business fundamentals are very good. You look at this, you see there's growth, tremendous growth of the demand in fertilizer moving forward. I, uh, you know, we are very strong in P. You know, this is a USGS figures uh, that say that Actually, they say 85% of world reserves of phosphates are in Morocco. And in the indispensable 
material for food security, very good business fundamentals looking forward, and we own 85% of that. Well, the 85%, I think we have, Morocco has more than 50%, but not 85%, but let's stay with 50%. That's significant. It should be very good business. Okay, so what, what's wrong? No growth in rock, because every, all the growth is downstream, is in fertilizer, and obviously there's a problem with prices. You know, that, by the way, uh, if you look at food prices th throughout the last 30 years, it's the same thing. So there's, you know, the food crisis today uh, that we've lived through, the, you know, alerted to at least through the past few years, is not due to the fact that we cannot produce food, is that the incentives for food production are not there. You know, the food prices and investment, you know, along with this, investment in food production has been tremendously low. The, the investment in R&D for food production is tremendously low. We just took it for granted. Same with phosphate. So coming out of this, we did a very expensive and long strategy exercise. I'm just kidding. It was very simple. We said our strategy has to be very simple. If we're going to have the 22,000 colleagues at OCP, we have 22,000 employees at OCP adhere to a strategy, it's got to be very easy to understand and easy to read. The strategy was we have to be stronger in fertilizer. This is our weak point. We only have 11%. Market share, it doesn't reflect, it doesn't represent, it's not reflected in the endowment, which is more than 50% of world reserves. We have to be present in fertilizer production. So we decided to triple our fertilizer uh, production capacity. Of course, we have to double our mining capacity to feed that, but that would mean also exporting less of the mining, uh, of, the, of the ore. Uh, we also have to have cost leadership. Can I ask why, I can't, I can't resist. Why do you think cost leadership is important in this context? You want to be the leader in a commodity or in downstream, but you want to also be the cost leader uh, in something like this. Any, any idea why this is important? Nobody courageous enough, okay. If you're gonna bring that much, yes, uh, Rami. Because you are 50% of the market, so yeah, that's a Machiavellic way to, to view it, but uh, I, I think we need a microphone also. I've been told that I should uh, systematically ask for a microphone, but this is unfair. It's just this, Rami is saying uh, this should be, uh, this is important in price, in making the price. It, it's true, because basically, I don't know if we have the cost curves here. Well, I'll go back to this, but, uh, well, the other reason is by bringing this amount of capacity, you have to make sure that others are not bringing the same type of capacity. Otherwise, you're going, you're reinforcing the vicious circle and prices are going to be depressed uh, for, forever uh, and, and bankruptcy not very far. If you are the cost leader, it acts also as a deterrent to the others. You know that even if the market prices drop, you're probably going to be the only one surviving in, in, in this environment. Okay, now, if you're going to be selling fertilizers, more fertilizers than rock, it's a completely different business model. This is a B2, mining is a B2B model. This is more of a B2C model. So you, your marketing, your commercial strategy has to become completely different, okay? Uh, you have to be closer to the customer. You have to think in terms of branding. You have all these niceties. So you, you have to, to change the way you do things and the way you have done things for 90 years. I forgot to mention, it's, it's a 90-year-old company. Okay? And you also have to have industrial flexibility because one of the complications we have, and we're, this is unique to us, by the way, none of our competitors has this problem or <laughs> or actually we turned it into an advantage, is that as you can see, by going downstream, we, ended up, we end up competing with our clients. We produce the same uh, finished product that they produce by buying the, the upstream uh, production. So 
That's not very easy to do, by the way, to compete with your own clients. You have to have, you know, it introdu introduces a marketing complexity um, that is very useful in some cases. It gives us, increases our bargaining power in many instances because we have different channels, but uh, it creates a complexity. But in order to arbitrage, you know, re uh, credibly between, uh, say, fertilizer and rock, you also have to introduce something that people managing big industrial complexes don't like, which is industrial complexity. Be able to shift your production almost in real time to support the negotiations of your commercial and marketing department. Okay? So uh, this to say that this program is huge. Okay? Tripling, the, doubling the mining capacity is opening up four new mines. Uh, for, it's opening up 10 new fertilizer plants okay? within less than 15 years. You know, this is the industrial footprint. This is, these plants are being built as we, two of them are almost ready. The others will be ready in a year and there are six others that are gonna be built. It's building a pipeline to transport phosphate. You know, this is a big industrial undertaking, but you cannot achieve this if you do not think upfront in transforming your, the, the, the entity. OCP in 2006 was a parastatal, was an office in French uh, administrative uh, uh, vocabulary, uh, was a bureaucracy. Very hierarchical. Remember, this is a mine, predominantly mining company having a few customers. I don't know how many. There were 60 customers, you know, buying each one uh, big chunks of your mine. Uh, and you're becoming a, a more flexible, agile, you know, all the things you've, you've learned about. You have to transform. And this is 22,000 people. So, you know. Look at left and right. You have to move from a very hierarchical to something that is more proactive, decentralized was the key because one of the things I discovered coming there was the role of the headquarters. You know, being such a large company, etc., we owed it to ourselves to have a very large headquarters. We had capacity of 2,500, a huge building, and we had 1,500 people in headquarters. This is in Casablanca, okay? And I, getting there, I shocked everybody by saying, what are we doing in Casablanca? There are no mines and no phosphate in Casablanca, and our clients are not in Casablanca. So the reality is not there. And the, as it turns out, this headquarters of this size was really the incarnation or the, 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 the symbol of hierarchy and bureaucracy. It had to be destroyed one way or the other. Okay? Uh, visibly. What we did is uh, we decided that since the business wasn't there, that headquarters shouldn't be that, that big. We didn't offer to put people, lay off people, because we need, we're in growth situation. We need people. Okay? So we said we're going to decentralize. If you're in headquarters, you should be either in the mining or industrial operations or with our clients elsewhere in the world, but you don't have no reason to be in headquarters. When we started to do this, I had all the mid -man middle managers telling me this is crazy, it's never been done, you're gonna kill a symbol, etc., etc. We had to do it because decentralization, we understood very quickly, when I say we, it's the whole management team because the first thing we did is bring you know, high level managers that were capable of carrying this whole transformation uh, together. Uh, we said, look, we, the middle managers told us, never been done, you can't do it. We went from a headquarters of 1,500 people to 400 people in three months. You know, believe me, every, almost everybody in headquarters wrote to me saying, you're crazy, this accounting function is gonna disappear, this thing, you know. And things were much better with 400 people than with 1,500 people. For one thing, the internet was faster. You know? <laughs> Okay, but, but we did it and it had to be a symbol of decentralization. You don't just speak about it, you have to have a symbol. The other thing we had, and should have started with this, is, well, in order to move from here to here, you have to have energy. 
I'm speaking to next to an engineering uh, university, in an engineering university. You have to have energy. How do you move this? The energy had to come from something. And the, 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 the and, and internal, you know, you can't, you have to, to, to move this. Uh, and you can have, you can, you can summon two types of energies, positive or negative. What we discovered is the positive one by saying, look, we are in, what I said before, we are embarking on a huge growth. This is the company uh, going back to its um, beautiful history because it used to be a conquering company, etc. Uh, you know, uh, uh, be nostalgic about that, that past. Uh, we're going to grow. Are you kidding? We're going to become more important. That's not enough. Okay? I'm sorry to say this. May, I may sound Machiavellic. I had a lot. We needed some negative energy also there. The negative energy I found, and again, I stumbled upon, we stumbled upon this. This was not, again, I pre, just don't want to give the impression that this was well designed, was the, the fact that the internal that the, the company, like many parastatals throughout the world in developing countries, had the pension fund in its own balance sheet. It was managing its, the pension fund of its employees. Okay, but if you're an employee of OCP and you know that the balance sheet has negative equity, you immediately know and think the company is eating up my, my pension. This is what's happening. When OCP made losses, it had, it picked, you know, it, it, it took the pension. Uh, so the, the other negative energy came from the fact that all these 22 colleagues feared that they were going to lose their pension. Okay? And that was fundamental. Okay? And indeed, when things got better, I explained what happened. In, uh, you know, in um, 2008, we externalized the pension fund. We wrote a check of $3.5 billion dollars to a professional pension fund manager outside the company that securitized their, uh, their, their pensions. But it was a big impetus for movement. The unions were behind this transformation. Traditionally, the unions are against this kind of thing. Here, they wanted to save their pension, a bit of negative energy. The other thing is, in a context where you are B2B and uh, uh, no offense intended, an engineer's culture in the company. These are all engineers, even in higher level management. Okay, we are proud of what? Production, increasing production. So the culture was, I produce as much phosphate as I can, and I'm proud of it. In fact, the only chart I found in my office coming in was the chart going up like this. And, and I, this, is this our results? They say, no, it's our production. The results are going like this. Okay. <laughs> But we're, they were rightly proud that production was increasing. And guess what, what commercial had to do? At any price, that's the case is, was that, try to sell what we produce. So we had to move, if we're value-oriented, value-minded, from a selling all we can produce mindset to produce only what we can sell my mindset. So you can say that to a group of people that have been doing this for years. They look at you and they say, nice, sure, okay? So the, the key moment when, was when with the crisis, the market dropped on us, okay? Had we stayed in this kind of culture, we would have destroyed the prices. Between, we would have gone into a price war. We've produced things, they cannot be stored. We have to sell them, okay? So what we decided to do was a big shock, what we call, uh, what even the, 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 the workers and the blue colors called the, the shutdown of 2009 was shutdown operation for the first time in the history of OCP. Okay? Just shutdown operation. Signal to the market that we, what we cannot, what they do not demand, we will not produce. We will not go into price wars. And we did it successfully. Okay? Uh, amazingly, Middle and even higher management was against that, okay? And I can tell you an anecdote that, that almost, frankly, brought tears to my eyes. When we decided to shut down, one of the major plants said no. The head of the plant said, I'm not gonna shut down. He said, you come and see by your, with your own eyes. I traveled, I went, it's out of the headquarters, obviously. Uh, and I said, what's wrong? He said, look, uh, all kinds of reasons, but the main reason is the workers are against this 
they think you're gonna, this is the first step towards laying them off. And by the way, and I had a three hour conversation with, with him and his management, there's a bunch, there are 200 workers outside who want to talk to you about this. And I'm going towards them and trying to you know, find all kinds of reasons to explain to them. And, you know, and there were 200 people and I asked who's gonna speak in the name of everybody. Some, some person comes forward and says, Mr. CEO, I only have one message for you. I said, what is it? I'm almost you know, uh, turning blue. And he says, look, we understand this shutdown is a strategic shutdown. We understand your new, where you want to take us. Right? And we fully adhere. You want a shutdown for two months, do it. Six months, do it. Two years, we're with you. And anybody who's telling you the opposite is lying to you. This was a direct message to the manager who was right behind me and was in his, now turning blue. <laughs> okay? So, so the models where we think it's management that drives change, etc. Okay. Here we had you know, 20,000 people understanding that it, this was in their interest. All you had to do is trust them and so that they can also trust you're going the right way. Anyway, the results are there, you know. We, we, this was, I, the previous slide was nominal prices. I have real prices to show you also that the same phenomenon happened here, but again, fell back. What the shutdown helped, here we had the commodity boom, uh, you know, of, the, of 2007, but what the shutdown helped do is not depress prices too much, okay? Uh, it signaled we're not going to get into a price war. Uh, we started increasing fertilizer production without even any capex, doubling the capacity with the existing plants by going through debottlenecking, de et cetera. But that's really the, what the workers have done. In terms of cost leadership, we moved from here to here just by producing better. The pipeline that I mentioned is going to take us clearly to a cost leadership, and it's functioning. We're doing the tests as we speak, and it's going to start functioning in a few weeks. Uh, remind, uh, remember I told you we wanted to move from 11% market share to 40% in terms of fertilizer. We're, we're halfway. We now own 20% of the uh, fertilizer seaborne market. Our financials have improved. If you look at EBITDA or whatever, uh, look, the, the trend is clear. This is an outlier. This is the commodity boom 2008. Best way to look at this is balance sheet, what I told you, minus $1.5 billion. This is in dirhams. Here, our balance sheet looks much better today. Uh, this whole experience, I won't try to cut it to 30 minutes, was consigned in a book uh, done by a management uh, consultant. It's in French, it's coming in English in a few weeks. It's gonna be produced in English. And I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you very much. Was I good on time? Okay. Yes, hello. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you. Um, uh, my question is, now that you have two different businesses, a more commoditized business, and uh, you integrate it forward into a more, you could say, specialty business. Uh, do you have two cultures um, uh, living in, at the same time within the same organization, and what kind of processes did you have to change to, uh, to foster the new culture, and what if there is any friction between those cultures? And also, if that kind of uh, uh, strategy of cutting on supply to bring the price up would work in a more uh, specialty business? Well, uh, uh, I'm not sure it will work in, work in all specialty or for that matter, all commodity businesses. You have to be able to be credible in doing this, you need to have a strong position in the market. If you're gonna, you know, if you, if you represent only two or 5% of the market and you, you cut down your production by a half, which is heavy, you still may not be able to impact the, the prices. So yeah, it's related to the market share, obviously. 
uh, it has nothing to do with cartel or, by the way, this is, it is our natural market share. Uh, now, the, the, the first question is, absolutely, it's, uh, what, you, what we had is two corporate cultures, the, the mining corporate culture and the industrial corporate culture. Uh, very, very difficult cohabitation between the two cultures. So part of it was integrating mining and, um, and industrial, okay? Because as I said, our strategy was in terms of, was one of industrial flexibility, between being able to arbitrage between the mining product and the chemical product required these people to talk to these people and required also making sure that if, if your arbitration is in favor of these guys, it doesn't reflect negatively on this. You know, that the fact that you've chosen not to sell so much uh, rock, phosphate rock, doesn't reflect on these guys. So a business unit wouldn't work because their, their P&L, their local P&L will be hurt. And if you're judging them on that basis, it's unfair. So what we did is simply integrate. We, we had two ways. One, symbolically, but more than symbolically, the pipeline now that you know, we use to produce rock, ship it on, uh, on trains, and then it would be received uh, at the other end. That was a, a discontinuity, uh, a physical discontinuity that uh, prolonged in the mind of people. The pipeline, symbolically, is, is our own. You know, we don't have to go through the railroad, and it ships the phosphate almost seamlessly from the mine to the, to, 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 to the industrial sites. The other thing we did is have one single manager per axis. So if you look, remember the map, uh, now we used to have a manager for the mine and a manager for the industrial site. It's the same manager that manages the integrated thing. And it goes a long way to, 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 uh, to integrate the, the cultures. Yes, sir. You said your R&D activities were... Do we need the microphone? Absolutely. Or? and you said your R&D activities fall into three categories, mm -hmm. uh, operational, differentiation, and disruptive. What kind of disruptive technology did, uh, did your company produce? Well, they're so disruptive, I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> <But you'd> <laughs> Only you could ask this question. <laughs> uh, well, uh, things like new, new ways uh, to do mining, uh, e-mining, which is highly disruptive for the, the workers, obviously. So what we did, and this has led, by the way, to, to, the, to this university, is we took a mining site front and dedicated it to, to research, uh, to this kind of disruptive uh, ideas. And we're going to relate it to the university, to the mining school of the university that Dean Schmidtlein mentioned, uh, so that the other disruptive type of thing is what, what if there is a substitute to phosphate tomorrow? Okay. That's on the f fertilizer end, right? Yeah. Okay, now for phosphate is used for two things, basically fertilizer, but also technical uses. Uh, you know, uh, food, uh, uh, conservation, when you drink a can of Coke, you probably are drinking a molecule of, uh, of phosphate from, from, from Morocco. It's the, the, the tangy taste in Coke comes from a tiny drop of phosphoric acid. That's the intermediate product. Coca-Cola Coca is a big client to us. So we have this diversified portfolio, which not all fertilizer producers do. But nevertheless, you have to look at the what if questions. Yeah. Uh, is it possible to know something? Uh, where, where are you? Yeah, here. Oh, OK. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you mentioned about uh, you know, shifting of your office from Casablanca to the near to the manufacturing site, mm. and uh, reduction of the people from 1,500 to 400, and still that. 
you got a better efficiency or better results at that time. Can you just elaborate something more about you know, how you have improved that efficiencies or how that uh, reduction in manpower has resulted in good efficiency of the, or good results? Yeah. So, uh, it's very simple. If you, uh, if you benchmark the size of a headquarter in a company like this, it shouldn't be 1,500. So necessarily there were people well, the best situation is they're not doing anything, but that's not the case. Is they, they invent something to do, and that becomes red tape. No, seriously. You know, our, our procurement process had 60 signatures in it, six zero. So there were 60 people in, in headquarters who had to, to sign something. At the end, you know, if you make it a three-step procurement process, it becomes more, more speedy, more efficient, etc. And th this sounds almost caricatural, but the, the first really determination I had to, 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 to reduce, uh, by the way, not the, some of them were invited, they had the option to leave with a good package, by the way, but this is not, we didn't ask them to leave, we told them to, to go on the, uh, on the sites, on the production sites. Uh, well, the, the, the first indication I had was going to visiting a, in one of the sites a sports facility, uh, and it was a ju judo class or some room. It was very dark. And I asked, why don't you turn on the lights? They said, the procurement for that light is on your desk, Mr. <laughs> this was a site that was 200. Uh, they couldn't buy, uh, the, the, talking about decentralization, they couldn't purchase light bulbs in, in that place without the authorization of the headquarter. So you can imagine that when you do away with this thing, the kind of, you know, it Im immediately improves uh, productivity beyond the, 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 the internet uh, why, the <laughs> speed. No, it, it's, it is, uh, uh, it's remarkable. You know, uh, people invent ways to stay in business, uh, but usually if it's not needed, they invent ways to, to slow down your business, basically. And here, there, I don't know which one came first, but we have time for both. Um, what are some of the things that OCP is doing uh, in terms of environmental sustainability? Uh, do we have the slide? No. On the, well, uh, let me just give you an example. Uh, I'll go back to this. We're doing a lot, uh, and it's not our philosophy, and we had uh, interesting discussions with Michael Porter on this, is not one of corporate social responsibility, absolutely not. Not even one of shared values. It is how you think about these things upstream in your business and make it an integral part of business that you're not going to the model where you produce and then you pay to mitigate the effects of what you do, okay? And, 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 and you usually, when, you, when you're thinking upfront about these issues, you, you go into, uh, it is not incompatible, to the, it even supports your, your competitiveness. One of the typical examples is this. Remember what I told you, this is the phosphate mine, this is the mine, and this is the chemical site, okay? We used to, you know, phosphate is humid, has 18% uh, has water humidity in it, we have to wash it to, to, to get away the, uh, uh, the unused uh, part of the phosphate, so we use a lot of water here. Then we have to dry it completely to put it on the train because the train can only take dry, dry stuff. You transport it dry here, and in order to process it in the, in the plant, you have to wash it again, okay? So one of the things we did is Say, we're going to change that. We're going to have a slurry pipeline. Okay? Cost five, $400 million, but it saves much more than that. Because now we wash it. We still have wash it, but we don't dry it. So you save on energy and you save on water. This is a water scarcity is a problem. It is an issue in Morocco. Okay? So it's transported as a slurry, by the way, with no energy, because this is 3,000 feet high. This is zero. So it goes down by gravity. And here, you don't have to use the water to rewash it again. You just process it as such. So here's a, 
here's an engineering project, here's a, a CapEx that, is, that improves our productivity, but also environmental footprint. I can go on and on. This, we use, you know, when you process phosphoric acid, you create gypsum stacks that, you, you have, that we have to store here, or worse, we threw in the ocean. One of the things we did is put a huge pipeline that goes to deep, no, it's not polluting, because it's, uh, say, you know, it's just uh, gypsum, okay? But visually, when you throw it here, it gets the whole area white, etc. Here, no problem, it goes down, settles in the, in the ocean, etc. So, no, we're taking that, uh, the, the, that responsibility very seriously. In fact, we even have work with, the, with MIT to, 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 to handle some of these things. There was a question there. Hi. Um, I, uh, I wanted to ask about the um, relationship between the phosphate prices and food prices in the context of sort of growing population and food scarcity concerns. Mm -hmm. um, so in the beginning, you showed this kind of graph of population increasing and sort of this need for agricultural productivity and so on. Mm -hmm. um, and then later you showed that as a result of being able to turn off your, your production, um, you can kind of get prices back up to sort of something that reflects more like supply and demand. But when I see phosphate prices go up, I also think that's gonna be driving up food prices. Um, and driving up food prices isn't necessarily a good thing for people in the world, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm just wondering, when you think about sustainability in the broader sense, um, how does your business interact with this question of food prices, food safety and secu food security, especially for the poor in the world, mm -hmm. and where do you see that all heading? Because I think I'd see in the short term kind of a, a useful sort of supply demand adjustment and so on, but mm -hmm. what's, your, what's your vision for the longer term on this? Excellent question. The, the, the need for basically ha having the price signal uh, working to adjust supply and demand, et cetera, is a fundamental one, by the way, okay? Because if you look at what happened, I, I have no idea where this slide is. Here it is. Look at what happened here. That's very destructive, okay? And that, but that's the result of 30 years of underinvestment in phosphate. If you're a phosphate company like OCP, which was the case, and you, you, you're going through 30 years of negative, sometimes, results, you, you know, the prices you're getting, is this real, are going down. Your costs are going up. Well, you, you absolutely do not invest. You cannot invest. When you cannot invest, you, you don't bring the phosphate required by demand. And that's what happens here. Here you have a fly-up that is due to a basic imbalance between f uh, supply and demand. So all we want is the price signal to work so that you know, those who should invest, invest and have the capacity to do this. All right? Now, the relationship between phosphate, uh, fertilizer prices and food prices is way overdone. In fact, the studies we, we had, not even ours, show that fertilizer input varying from region to region is really a few percentage points of the food price. It's nothing. The, the, big, the, the big input is what in your, in your, what do you think the big input? I know you, you know, you work with me, you know. <laughs> no, it's energy. It's energy. Okay? Uh, okay, but in, indeed, because of this spike, it was so visible, uh, there's been some not so serious, but academic work pointing to the fact that it's fertilizer prices uh, driving food price. Absolutely false, because our pricing strategy is to look at the capacity, obviously, like many businesses, of our clients to pay. So it's more fertilizer prices is following food prices. In fact, if you, if you plug the food prices here, they grew, up, they grew before the fertilizer prices. There's always a time lag. Okay? The other thing about food security here, I show you a couple of slides that you'll, here, uh, here. This is the fertilizer consumption in Africa. Absolutely none, okay? The, the darker it is, the more intense fertilizers, intensely the fertilizers are used. Yet, 80% of arable land in Africa is unused, okay? And look at the size of Africa, this is not, you can have China, US, India, and most of Europe in Africa. 
So when, when, we, when you say food security in Africa, you think problems in Africa. You, we should think solutions in Africa, okay? Uh, especially if you look at the Arab land decreasing worldwide, the solution is gonna come from, at least a big part of the solution, but it's gonna require using more fertilizers. Okay? Uh, so, uh, if you look at things scientifically, you, you quickly get to different solutions than, the, than what the headlines uh, tend to indicate. I think we're I, done. Yeah. One last question, maybe? There was one last question, maybe? Hi. Yep. Uh, so you mentioned in earlier in your talk that uh, it was more realistic to claim that Morocco had 50% uh, of the uh, phosphate reserves rather than 85%. Uh, when you say that, uh, do you have in mind an increased competition from other countries such as Arabia Saudi and uh, uh, Algeria? And uh, what are the odds that OCP would maintain its leadership position uh, in uh, increased competition? Um, yeah. Thanks. We love competition. Remember, I'm a former telecom regulator. I love competition. Uh, no, obviously we're not the, look, we, as I showed, we, our market share, uh, this, this was the seaborne market share, by the way, but our world market share in phosphate is, is minute. It's 6% or 7%, okay? So we have competitors, Saudi Arabia here, Mosaic and other companies in the US. We have plenty of competitors to worry about. Don't, please. Algeria is also a, a large producer of, uh, uh, of phosphate, not fertilizer, Jordan, has a lot of, uh, has, you know, the phosphate, by the way, tends to be uh, around here. Here and China are the biggest phosphate uh, uh, sites, so to speak. But you see the paradox of Africa. The fertilizer used here comes from Africa, yet Africa uses a tiny portion of that fertilizer. Thank you very much. Thank you.